Cool. Let's get this show on the road. Um, like 61 people. Uh, so uh, thank you everybody for um, for uh, for showing up and uh, to Cleveland Big Data the July 13th 2020 meetup. So we're doing this virtual style, obviously still in the middle of the coronavirus. Uh, just mentioning this on the uh, recording here for for posterity. Um, we had this planned uh, in person. Obviously, we had to make. Uh, uh, logistical changes with the speaker and the uh, the speaker and the agenda did not change. So we have a special guest here today. Uh, Jay Horowitz uh, from uh, NASA Glenn is going to do a talk about the the history, the evolution and history of uh, the uh, data visualization lab and the graphics visualization lab. And uh, as many folks know, um, I've got a uh, a ceremony. Sometimes the speakers, sometimes we'll do a timing uh, or, you know, three 20 minute talks. Um, and then occasionally when there's a special guest uh, that has the floor for the entire time, um, I'll do a ceremonial knocking over the timer. So here's the timer, right? <laughs> so Jay will have uh, the floor for the entire time and uh, he can take questions and talk as, uh, as, as long as he wants. Um, and uh, just to let folks know, we will be having a mini mega meetup in September. Obviously, this is not going to be in person as has been in the last couple of years, but we will be having an extended agenda um, uh, in, the, um, in, in September. Uh, so looking forward to that and I'll get the, uh, the details posted. Um, and uh, with that, um, one of the things that we also do is we'll do shout outs for um, people that are looking for, um, you know, looking for hires or if anybody's looking for an opportunity. So uh, if you could please post that right now, we're not going to do it audio, but we are going to post it in the chat. So if you have anything to say, if you're, uh, if you're in a company that's looking for something, please post that in the chat. Likewise, maybe if you happen to be um, you know, looking for maybe a new opportunity, please post that in the chat so we can, uh, um, please feel free to go ahead and uh, we'll do a couple of minutes of, of the recruiting shout outs. And don't see anything posting right now. Maybe give it 30 more seconds if no one's posting anything, then we'll just go, uh, we'll go to you, Jay. Oh, here we go. Uh, McKesson's hiring for data scientists and uh, Michael Stratton looking for a PHP full lamp, uh, full stack lamp opportunities. You might want to put a um, an email address. Yeah, there we go in the uh, in the chat uh, so folks knew how to know how to contact you. Uh, Calvin Robinson as a uh, internship opening for fall for data integration. Uh, Calvin, you might want to post the contact info. Um, Michael Stratton, that was the one from before. The uh, full stack lab developer is uh, Mike at sunnytree.com. I'm oh, sorry, sunnytree.org. Okay, a few more rolling in. Good, good. All righty. Man, it looks like they're slowing down. Um, so uh, on with that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go to, to Jay and do, uh, do your thing, Jay. So uh, hey. I'm going to stop sharing. Great, great. Uh, don't know where to look. Uh, First of all, uh, thank you guys. It was uh, a real treat reminiscing uh, through all these uh, images that uh, somehow followed me home when I retired. And uh, I got to see not just some old friends and old technologies, but uh, sort of remember what it was like in the medieval days when uh, uh, computers cost a mere $30 million to do that you can do on your phone these days. Uh, also, the original talk was uh, given at NASA and uh, included a lot of mentions of the people that I expected to be in the auditorium and uh, shout outs to them. 
Uh, so since I didn't expect a lot of the NASA people to be there, some of the talk doesn't include that. But uh, now that I see that a lot of them have signed in, hi guys, I will uh, try to uh, uh, acknowledge you when things are appropriate. And uh, fortunately they're muted so they can't correct any of the uh, mistakes that I make. They probably will during the, the login. Anyway, uh, let's see, before we get started, let me, let me put on my uh, virtualization, my virtual visualization, that's, that's sort of me. Uh, and uh, let's see if I can figure out how to share my talk. Let's see, share screen. Does that work? Okay. It looks good. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, kind of a unique facility that uh, NASA Lewis, uh, later NASA Glenn, they renamed it, had, uh, that still has. Uh, and uh, this is the period that I was there from 1989 when it was established to 2012 when I left. If you'd have walked into the lab at, uh, with the lights out, uh, this is what you'd see. And uh, if you turn the lights on, uh, this is a bunch of the technology that we had in uh, about uh, 16 years ago. Uh, we had 3D projection systems. Uh, we had a broadcast quality video editing suite. There's more equipment behind this. Uh, we had a digital animation recorder, which I'll talk about. We had Cleveland's first HD TV tape and disc recording system uh, before any of the TV studios. Uh, we had uh, various virtual reality equipment. This one is an HDMR system. Uh, we had uh, some technology from the 1870s that we used, the stereoscope. Uh, various doodads that we uh, made for conferences and things, uh, M&Ms. Uh, and what's not in this picture, and is already obsolete by the time this picture was taken, is we had an alternate frame buffer and a Pixar image computer, which I am sure probably nobody in the audience that wasn't at NASA has ever heard of. In the room adjoining that lab was a, another fun-filled room uh, that had a stand-up virtual reality uh, uh, environment that tracked your head. We had a virtual reality treadmill. Yes, we had a treadmill in our lab. Uh, we had a multi-panel high resolution power wall that uh, had a whopping, let's see, it would be 5760 by 3240 pixels. Uh, so I'll address quite a bit of these things in the talk and, and why we wound up having them. But uh, as you can see, it was kind of a uh, interesting conglomeration of the technologies that were available at the time. Okay, some of the topics I'll talk about are supercomputing and digital science, uh, what the environment was before the GVIS lab was created, why we created the GVIS lab and the ACCL, which is uh, something else I'll talk about, uh, some applications that we did with digital video, and uh, uh, the aero research that was done in conjunction with the high performance computing and communication program, uh, some stuff about virtual reality, uh, the Groove Lab, which is still there, and uh, some public outreach, as well as why the facility worked and why it's still working. Okay, first a little bit of background about me. Uh, I got a PhD in physics from Ohio State, but ooh, way back in 73. Uh, and got a postdoctoral at uh, Case Western Reserve, actually in the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, they were interested in doing some research in uh, lung mechanics and other phenomena and uh, decided it was a lot easier to teach a PhD physiology than to try to teach doctors physics. Uh, so I was there for a while and because I knew about computers, having done that on my PhD, I sort of became the computer expert there. Uh, this is me sitting in front of what was typical uh, lab computers in the days in 1976. That's a DEC PDP-80 computer uh, with a bunch of A to D converters. It was often found in uh, labs before the PDP-11s, if anybody remember those came out. Uh, it had uh, 8,000 words of uh, 12K, 12 bits per word. Uh, anyway, I decided uh, I was interested in computer graphics and uh, 
the field was just springing up and uh, NASA had the need for somebody that not only knew computer graphics, but surprisingly, uh, knew database technology and Unix, which were foreign to NASA Lewis at the time. And what was going on was in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, particularly due to Seymour Cray, uh, supercomputers became available. And that allowed scientists to do in silico experiments, experiments in a computer. Uh, the Cray one that was installed in 1982 at NASA uh, was a vector architecture. I don't even know if they make vector architectures anymore, but uh, uh, the computers basically you would load up uh, an entire vector of floating point numbers and another vector of floating point numbers, and you could multiply the two, and all of them got multiplied together in one computer cycle, one machine cycle. And so that sped things up basically by his, uh, the size of the vector. Uh, that Cray one, which uh, we had, had 4 million, 24 bits of memory. So uh, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, you guys are probably pretty excited about that, but uh, a million 64 bit words. Hey, Jay, uh, I gotta ask, did you ever sit on the seat? Oh, everybody did. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah, we have pictures of everybody sitting on the seat. Uh, it was padded. And uh, uh, the other reason that the uh, computer was faster was the shape of it in sort of a C-shaped uh, shortened the size of the wire connections between uh, modules to speed up the electron flow between them. So by making the size of the wires smaller, uh, the computer was faster, as well as the vector architecture. It was liquid cooled, uh, required a huge, huge uh, power supply uh, that was located outside the room. Uh, it was also wired, uh, from what I understand, by a bunch of women that uh, was like a sewing circle. It was all wired by hand. Anyway, that was the Cray, Cray 1S, and it allowed scientists to do experiments. And uh, what do I mean by experiments? Well, the experiments were basically simulations rather than just solving equations. And a lot of equations and simulations, numerical simulations had to be developed, which is a lot of what our researchers did. And as the need for, as the computers took over the experiments, you needed a way of analyzing the results. And people have used their eyes and brains to analyze data forever. Uh, our eye brain system is an exceptional tool for detecting patterns. And so, in almost every field of science. The, they had telescopes, microscopes, x-rays. This is a Schlieren photography uh, that shows basically the shadows of pressure waves, actually they're density waves uh, on an inlet. And so even in the wind tunnels, they took pictures of things. Well, as they moved to computer simulations, uh, you needed basically a digital camera uh, in order to be able to analyze your results. And so computer graphics, and scientific visualization was really the, the evolution of what I like to call digital cameras that sort of duplicated these, but gave you a lot more capability. You now had the ability to look at flow arrows and color contours and uh, things that you really couldn't do easily with a camera. Uh, so visualization of data sort of evolved in the same way that the numerical uh, simulation of data and experiments came about. In the early 80s at NASA Lewis, uh, there was still a publication graphics division. There were still people which drew diagrams and charts and researchers gave them data and they plotted it up. Uh, but as things like uh, plotters and other output devices uh, became available, uh, some of that data analysis and plotting went to computers and uh, people programmed them. Uh, most researchers weren't programs and uh, they didn't have access to computer e computers either. I'll talk about that in a minute. So the uh, computer services division, which had lots of groups associated with networks and mini mainframes and mainframes, also had a group that was uh, involved in programming these digital graphics packages uh, to help analyze the data for the scientists. Uh, this was a typical 2D plot of some data. Uh, but as scientists started to do real experiments in the computers, you needed a way of visualizing those results. Uh, this was a typical 2D plot uh, that scientists looked at. 
Uh, it was using a program called Graph2D, which was developed by researchers and, and programmers at NASA. Uh, and I'll talk about its evolution in a little bit. Uh, it ran on an IBM mainframe computer uh, or on the Amdahls, which were main, IBM mainframe clones. Uh, I'm pretty sure Amdahl is out of business now. Uh, the displays were for the most part uh, either vector displays, like the early computer graphics games, uh, uh, Battle Tank, or one of the, trying to remember Battle Zone, trying to remember the vector games that I played with uh, in the 80s. Uh, or they were raster terminals that had color table lookups. Uh, having RGB bytes per pixel was too expensive, so they stored in each pixel one 8-bit value that was used to do a color table lookup. Uh, so we had a whopping 256 colors available at the time. Pretty exciting. Uh, slowly but surely, the graphics packages became a little bit more sophisticated and expanded from beyond scientific visualization to a whole host of other uh, management graphics, pie charts, that type of stuff. Uh, but still mostly on mainframes. And uh, one of the first jobs that I had at NASA was to hand digitize the NASA worm, this, this logo, uh, for use with the, the graphics packages, uh, telegraph and display, which uh, is sort of the equivalent of uh, maybe some form of PowerPoint. And I'm not sure what the equivalent would be, but uh, they weren't very sophisticated. Uh, little piece of trivia, if you ever want to know if a NASA logo, this worm is official, the curve of the N has to dip below the line that the other letters are on. Otherwise, it's not official, uh, which made it a mess to try to then line that up with other graphics and other text. But that's what the NASA logo looked like. As scientists moved to 3D simulations, you needed a 3D graphics package. And uh, they expanded the graph 2D, had similar commands, but uh, expanded quite complicated to expand a 2D package to a 3D package. Your data structures had to be totally different. And uh, Don Sissoka, who I saw is out there, was uh, one of the ones in our group that uh, worked with IBM contractors to create a 3D graphics package uh, for the IBM mainframes. Uh, it looks simple just from this one simple little diagram, but if you might notice, uh, it uses hidden line algorithms. You don't see the, the grid underneath going through the letters. Things like that were, uh, were not trivial to do. Uh, also, it was a device independent package. And uh, what that meant is it supported all of the devices that came out at the time. Uh, this is a list of all the graphics packages we had. Uh, there was ISCO, this is Graph3D, CADM was a computer aided design package. Patran, which was a structural analysis package, Movie BYU, which was uh, actually used in uh, some of the computer graphics from Tron. Uh, and if you'll notice, these graphics devices, everything from terminals to uh, plotters, uh, only Graph3D supported all of them. And that's because we had somebody in our group, Norb Seidel, who I think is still in Australia now, would write drivers specifically for those packages. If somebody bought a device that uh, did graphics or plotted, we would write a device driver for it for Graph3D. Uh, interestingly enough, I did a check. Uh, these are all the companies and devices that just no longer exist anymore. Uh, so that was a time in which uh, if you bought stock in these companies, uh, you probably lost out. Graph3D did some pretty sophisticated stuff for the time. Uh, it supported shaded surfaces uh, and took advantage of all 256 colors that were available on some device. Uh, it had a set of commands that you could do from the command line or incorporate as uh, uh, calls in a Fortran library. Uh, it became extensively used for several years uh, and so many researchers had written their codes in uh, applications so that the Graph3D calls would be part of their simulation uh, programs that uh, they didn't want to give it up. And uh, we spent a couple of years porting Graph3D to a bunch of non-IBM systems uh, using a variety of tricks. Uh, 
it might even run on Windows today if you had the, the right compilers. But uh, I don't know when the last Graph 3D application was developed, but uh, it was at the lab for quite a while. Uh, at the time, most researchers did not have a computer on their desk. Uh, don't forget, to look in 1980, PCs were you know, a couple thousand dollars each, and uh, there were like two to 3,000 engineers out at NASA Glenn. So it was a big expense. Uh, also, there's not that much they would be able to do with them. Uh, so they had these rooms uh, that was part of a huge program called the Eye Care Project. Uh, and the rooms would have sophisticated graphics terminals, sophisticated for the time, uh, connected by a, a network called the Link, which I'll talk about. And throughout the whole lab, there were only three buildings that had these uh, eye care rooms. Uh, ours was one. This is this is the one in our building, uh, and it's actually one of the bigger ones. Uh, and it hosted a variety of terminals. Uh, but this is where almost all the graphics was done. People would go to a terminal in one of these rooms uh, because if they had a computer terminal in their room it uh, most likely did not do any graphics it was probably an IBM text terminal uh, you don't need to look at the detail of this but what, one of the things I found interesting uh, this was pre-internet and every connection effectively had to be almost point to point well it was point to point between the terminal Oh, I should go over here. The terminal and either the mainframe or some device in the computer room that it connected to. So each one had to go through a modem and then it went on the equivalent of a like a TV cable system, broadband cable, to another modem to another to back to the, the computer or whatever device was connected to it. So every time you added a device, you needed to have a pair of modems, one on each end. And they needed to be assigned a frequency, just like a TV channel, on the cable. So this was a plot of the frequency allocation that uh, the networking group had to maintain. And uh, just like assigning a TV channel to a TV station, they would assign a frequency channel to a device. Actually, they had to assign two frequencies, one for outgoing data and one for incoming data. Uh, nowadays, you connect up an Ethernet cable and you can do and get to anywhere. Uh, but in those days, it was really point to point. It was really a pretty remarkable system and uh, quickly became obsolete. So by the late 80s, the computer environment for the supercomputing had changed a lot. Uh, the Cray 1 was replaced with a Cray XMP, which now had 4 million 64 bit words. Uh, this is, I, th I think the padding on the seats got a little bit thicker. <laughs> I think the 1S didn't have as good at padding. Uh, this was a disk drive for the Cray, and it held 1,200 megabytes of data. Uh, and it would run so hot, if we ever had a power failure room, people would run around opening up these Cray disk drives because uh, uh, they, would, they would overheat if you didn't open them up. Also around that time, the first silicon graphics workstations appeared. And uh, that was probably like 1988, 89. Uh, and they were standalone computers, workstations that did interactive 3D graphics in real time. Uh, really, really sophisticated for the time uh, and expensive. Uh, and they slowly started to appear. Uh, they were the first really Unix workstations, uh, those and some Suns that appeared on the lab at the time. Up until that point, the lab was pretty much an IBM shop. This is a aerial view of the building that uh, everything was housed in. Uh, it was called the Rack Building, which was the sort of research analysis center. And from what I understand, uh, it was called the Research Analysis Center rather than a computer center because in, in the late 70s, there were some uh, anti-war protesters that uh, blew up a computer facility at the University of Wisconsin. And so research places were loath to name a computer, uh, use the word computer or mathematics in the name of their buildings, uh, lest they get attacked. This is a fairly large 
area for building a computer room and it was unique at the NASA facilities. Uh, there was a lot of politicking involved in terms of uh, which directorate or division uh, could control the computers at the time. And NASA Glenn wound up with almost all of its computers in one room. And uh, that had a lot of advantages and some disadvantages, but it was unique to NASA Glenn, uh, NASA Lewis at the time. Other centers like Goddard wound up with uh, uh, each building having its own little computer center. And when things like networking and other things came to be developed, the central management of all the computers at the center worked out fairly well for Glenn and was a lot more difficult to do at uh, some of the other centers. Uh, they expanded the center in 1989 and built another large computer room, which I'll talk about, then some additional office spaces. The GVIS lab would eventually be located there. The main reason for the development of that computer room was they wanted to build a secure computing environment for supercomputing. Uh, this was at the height of the Cold War. Uh, NASA had missions that uh, overlapped those of the Defense Department. The shuttle did some Defense Department uh, flights. And uh, so they wanted to do a facility that was a lot more secure than uh, the main computer room in which people walked in and out and had all sorts of other uh, purposes for running data. Uh, so this room had uh, uh, a, raised a raised concrete floor that could support a second cray. Uh, the power to the room had to go through these filters that would filter out, out EMF signals. Uh, it had internal air conditioning that blew to the outside rather than ductwork which connected it. And all of this was designed to basically be a secure computer environment that was uh, very well protected. Uh, however, by 1990, almost all of the needs for a Cray for doing supercomputing disappeared. By that time, you can get a bunch of mini computers and workstations, throw them in a much smaller room, and do everything that you could do on a Cray. Uh, so the building had this expensive new facility or environment uh, with nothing to do. And uh, the division uh, chief at the time says, well, why don't we... Uh, why don't we use it for something else? Let's do some experimental work. And so he wound up uh, encouraging the development of what was called the Advanced Computational Concepts Lab. Uh, and that room held a whole variety of early parallel processors from companies that no longer exist, like Convex and Paragon. Uh, it later held clusters. Uh, NASA was one of, NASA Glenn was one of the first to do uh, cluster computing and has evolved different size clusters over the years. This was one of the first ones called the LACE cluster for Lewis Advanced Cluster Environment. Uh, it either had 64 IBM 32 processors or 32 IBM 64 processors. I forget which was which. Uh, but there's rows after rows after rows of these workstations. And they were all interconnected with a uh, experimental switch that IBM developed that allowed them to talk to one another uh, and basically act as one giant programmable supercomputer. Uh, for a couple months, this was uh, one of the fastest and had most onboard memory of any supercomputer in the world. It was then you know, quickly usurped, but uh, uh, we should try to get somebody from NASA to talk to you guys about the evolution of cluster computing at NASA because it was a it was a pretty interesting environment. Next door to it was a smaller facility, still a secure environment. Uh, they said we could use it as long as we kept the integrity of the uh, facility. Uh, so the first thing we did was drill holes in the wall to uh, put cables from one place to another. Uh, we taped them up. We figured nobody would ever need it. They didn't. Uh, the purpose of the lab, the GVIS, so good for graphics visualization, and also GWIS was kind of a fun name. Uh, the idea was to provide tools for the center in support of their mission, the visualization tools, and to provide the center with access to the emerging technologies. A lot of the stuff that was in this area was too expensive for everybody to have, but you wanted everybody to have access to it. Uh, and so, we were really very, very big on providing central access to tools that uh, 
and expertise to use them uh, <clears throat> that I think was a big advantage of one of the things that the lab did is researchers from all over the center would be able to come to our lab to use tools uh, rather than have to buy this technology for themselves. Uh, the other thing is the images that were created were really useful tools for management and uh, program uh, mission directors to promote their programs. Uh, they needed to convince uh, Congress and the public and everything else about what they were doing. And so a large part of ours was to take the interesting data that the scientists did and to try to package it in a way that the public and others would be able to understand. Uh, I see that uh, this is Mary Vickerman, who's out there somewhere. Hi, Mary. I saw her name on the, one of the joined lists. Uh, this is Peter Quinn. That's uh, probably me in a much younger version. So some of the types of visualization that we did at the lab uh, were things like flow visualization, uh, swirling flows. You'll, you'll see this structure a lot. We did an awful lot with jet engines. Uh, discrete particle visualization, where we basically had to uh, get the locations from some simulation, in this case of a piston-driven pressure wave, where as the piston pushes down, the researcher had to compute the interactions and collisions and velocities of every single particle, uh, which from what I understand took uh, several days of cray time to compute. Uh, so this was a visualization. We did structural analysis of various things. Uh, Dorothy Carney, who I saw is out there, hi Dot. Uh, her husband was involved in the analysis of uh, the deformations of everything from what a broken engine blade does to an engine to, in this case, what the piece of foam that uh, uh, damaged the leading edge of the wing in the Columbia shuttle that uh, caused the, the accident. So this was a single frame from an animation. Um, we also did some mission simulations in which there was various uh, uh, spacecraft and others that wanted to test how things like the antennas and solar panels can unwind during a mission. Uh, so we did a, a whole variety of different types of visualizations. As the scientists started to get much more sophisticated and the supercomputers got more sophisticated, uh, they started to be able to do time varying simulations. In other words, record all of the data associated with a time step and save multiple time steps to see how processes evolved. But in order to view it, you needed to see that as an animation. And at the time, in the 90s, uh, videotape was really the only practical way to do it. And rather than spend all that time and effort and dumping it on a VHS tape, uh, we wound up buying a fairly sophisticated digital, uh, well, this is now an analog studio, reel-to-reel -reel analog recorders like TV studios have, uh, lots of editing and uh, color correction equipment. Uh, but we also got a hold of an Abacus A60 digital video recorder. This was a device that was used by broadcast TV for doing instant replays uh, because you can wind it and rewind it because uh, it was just basically a hard drive. It digitized analog video into a 720 by 480 pixel YUV format. Uh, this, this was NTSC, digital NTSC. Uh, these were non-square pixels. You're probably used to 640 by 480 with square pixels, but that's what the device did. Uh, interestingly, it had internet access, and that allowed us to use one of the channels on the LabWide's closed circuit TV uh, to broadcast the output of the A60 recorder, and it also allowed people to uh, uh, control it, which was, was pretty unique for our center. Uh, this is Peter Quinn, who's now writing songs in Nashville. Uh, he was a video editor producer that we brought on board uh, because not only did we want his talent for using the equipment, but we knew that the scientists knew how to look at their data. So if they saw an animation of their data, they knew what it was all about. But if you're showing it to other researchers or the public, they don't. And so you needed to be able to tell a story of we're viewing it from this angle. It's part of this structure. And, and so a large... Uh, aspect of what Pete's skills and things were was to add titles and edit and basically put together a story to help the scientists get their uh, stories across. 
So even though we bought this device for doing scientific analysis, uh, it turned out having a digital video device gave us some capabilities that we didn't expect and took advantage of. For example, uh, we had a group that was studying microgravity fluids and flames. And if they took video of a bunch of particles in a fluid by coloring the different time steps and adding them together and having that as sort of a moving average animation, uh, you got these interesting visualizations of the flow within the fluid. And uh, the color tells you which direction it was going because you knew that the purple part was earlier than the cyan part. And the length gave you some indication of how fast it was going. So just a simple superposition of uh, and coloring of digital video frames uh, provided some interesting simple visualizations. Uh, also, it gave us the ability for combining analog data from instruments with video information. So uh, this was a study of uh, flames in microgravity. Uh, something that was extensively studied by the uh, at, at NASA Glenn. Uh, flames don't behave the same way in microgravity as they do on the Earth. Candle flames are shaped the way they do because the hot air rises from the buoyancy of the gravity. You don't have that gravity, you don't have that buoyancy. Uh, but even in the shuttle or on the ISS, it's not a complete zero G environment. There's these tiny little micro accelerations which were measured by a device, the X and Y coordinates of the acceleration. And the scientists were able to, with our digital video system, find those video frames and those time steps associated with the data to combine and join them in a way that they could see the acceleration vector and the shape of the flame at any given instant in time. Uh, one of the many visualizations that uh, Mary Vickerman did for that group. Uh, here's some more uh, in which video was combined with digital simulations of the same phenomena. In this case, there were two cameras looking at a flame moving across a liquid surface, uh, liquid fuel, uh, and this was a top view from a simulation. Here's a side view that shows the flame, the particles in the fluid underneath, and a digital simulation of that phenomena. And you see it predicts that there's a swirl as the liquid heats up as the flame moves across it. And that's the uh, same thing that was predicted. Ooh, I gotta watch where I'm putting my cursor. That's the same thing that was uh, predicted by the experiment. Our bread and butter was uh, the aeronautics research visualization. <clears throat> Lots of researchers were looking at everything from uh, advanced propeller technology to how fluids mixed in, uh, in, in turbulent behavior to what happens inside a jet engine compressor to I have no idea what these are, but we did them. It looks awesome. Ah, they were. Uh, in fact, this is uh, Dale Van Zanti, who I see signed in. Glad, glad I put this in there, Dale. Uh, this, uh, maybe he can explain what it is during the, uh, during the question and answer, but uh, it, was, it was a visualization of uh, a series of researchers work that was trying to increase the efficiency and uh, cleanliness of jet engines. And uh, this was one of the technologies. Uh, let's see if I can restart that because Interestingly enough, uh, this was probably done 50, 10 years ago, and uh, you'll see sort of an update. They're, they're still working on this problem. <coughs> One of the things that I need to get across is the difference between, particularly for large data-minded people like you guys, uh, is the difference between data complexity and visual complexity. Uh, a lot of people see some of our graphics, like the one over here, and say, well, you know, it doesn't look that complicated. Uh, this looks complicated. This image has six polygons. It uses all sorts of texture mapping and other tricks to make it look complicated, but it's six polygons. It's a basic blender model. This, every single blade here had 4,800 polygons. 
it just so happens that the data that you were visualizing, I don't know if it was pressure or temperature, is pretty much uniform around most of it, so it doesn't look visually that interesting. But it's quite, quite complicated. And uh, this is one of the needs for supercomputers. These grids, which the researchers spent a lot of time developing the grids, uh, the shape of them and the complexity was determined by the physics. Uh, if you expected a lot of turbulence or interesting behavior that occurred in a small space, you needed a much finer grid than you would in areas in which you didn't expect there to be as much change. So they spent an awful lot of time, probably still do, refining their grids. As you can see here, the grids down where surfaces meet and you know, where you expect a little bit more turbulence and interesting stuff to happen, that and along the edges, uh, get to be fairly complex grids. So the fact that visually this isn't that complicated, in order to generate that picture, you needed lots of grid points, which means you needed to do lots of computations, which means you needed to do a uh, big job on a computer. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was a saying, so, a saying that uh, all CFD jobs take 12 hours, no matter how fast your computer is. Because what happened was if a computer got 10 times faster. We got a new Cray, so the computer was 10 times faster. The researchers said, good, now I can go in and cut my grid into 10, <clears throat> 10 times as fine a detail. Uh, because in many cases, the more detail you can cut it up into, the more fine detail of the simulation you can get. Uh, so if your simulation, you started at night, you came in in the morning 12 hours later and it was done, if they gave you a faster computer, you just said, okay, I'll run the simulation again it'll take 12 hours because that's let it run overnight so the faster computers just uh, generated more data same number of jobs <laughs> but it also needed for the researchers some high resolution displays keep in mind that animation which you watched on a tv at the time uh, was 640 by 480 and the workstations they were using were typically 1024 by 768, believe it or not. Uh, that was considered high resolution, but it was higher resolution than TV. So we spent quite a bit of time evaluating and then uh, working with Sony that brought in uh, their digital HD, well, their HD TV recording systems that uh, uh, had tape and disc recording. It was an analog system, not a digital system. Uh, but it was a little higher than 1280 by 1024 equivalent pixels. Uh, it looked fantastic. Uh, the reason it was analog is the industry had not yet settled on a digital video standard. Uh, and the analog, uh, you know, basically scan lines worked pretty well. The images looked fantastic. Uh, several TV studios uh, in the Cleveland area came to our lab to see what HDTV looked like because uh, we had it before they did. Because People didn't have HDVs in their home, so there was no reason for them to broadcast it. Also, the color models were more accurate than NTSC. Uh, and for the researchers, where they're mapping data, uh, pressures and temperatures and flows to colors, the color accuracy turned out to be an important part of why we went to HDTV. Uh, but eventually, their re workstations and things got to, to be pretty good, and uh, they had high end, but uh, they did. What I told you they do, they split their grids in part and wanted to visualize stuff with even higher resolution. Uh, so we built a <coughs> thing called a power wall, uh, which was nine HDTV monitors uh, driven by nine computers and a 10th computer that basically uh, coordinated the output of all of them. Uh, and that allowed us to display effectively 5,060 by 3,240 pixels. Uh, I know you're excited. Nowadays, people's phones can do 4K. So, you know, uh, just amazing. But uh, uh, this, this allowed researchers to basically look at extremely high resolution images of their, of their grids without having to zoom in and move across. They get the big picture as well as the, the more detailed picture. Where do we get the money for all this? Well, big shout out to the 
HPCCP program. Uh, in 1996, DARPA, NASA, NSF, and others all shared in a congressionally mandated program to develop high performance computing equipment technologies, uh, networking technologies, database technologies. Uh, it's funded a uh, big effort in doing research in engine simulation to help the uh, America's jet engine companies, uh, GE engine aircraft and others. Uh, it provided money for the clusters and parallel processors that we put into the advanced computing uh, and communications lab. And an awful lot of the technology that's available today that uh, uh, you people out in the big data world and cluster world are using uh, were all the outgrowth of the high performance computing communications program. Uh, they also provided uh, some environments uh, for NASA called the Laborative, oh, Advanced Collaborative Environments. Uh, ours was called the Groove Lab, and I'll get into that one in a little bit. But first, let me talk about virtual reality. I use this silly cartoon to introduce virtual reality. Uh, and you think, oh, that's kind of silly. But what if you wanted to learn how to use a yo-yo in the one-sixth gravity of the moon? Or what if you wanted to train an astronaut to unspool wire in space in front of the ISS? You needed some way to simulate the physics and mechanics of strange environments. Uh, and virtual reality really let you do that. So uh, besides being fun for games and things, there are some very interesting uses for virtual reality and our lab got into it big time. <clears throat> the first use of virtual reality was more for demonstration purposes. Uh, there, there was a program run by the communications and networking group uh, with a commercial product called TerraVision that basically was sort of like imagining uh, simulating a drive across the country using Waze, but the Waze has to, every time you cross a geographic boundary to a different state, look up the map data on a different computer. So this basically simulated a flight across the United States where the maps were basically brought in by computers that were distributed uh, at different centers around the country. And to make it look cool, uh, they did it in virtual reality. And this group, Mike Zernick and Dave Brooks, brought the first uh, virtual reality equipment to the lab. Uh, this picture, by the way, is a fake. He's looking at his hand. He doesn't have a glove on. He doesn't see it. He's just, it looks like he's doing something, but that was done for some publication. And it was used extensively, even though it doesn't show anything. Uh, one of the things that our group did for the Office of Education that was an interesting virtual reality project was we developed a simulation working with the Tom Benson, uh, who's one of our research engineers, uh, to work out the mechanics and equations of the Wright brothers' flight. Uh, Tim DeDool of the Office of Education uh, funded our programmers to develop a simulation of the Wright brothers' first flight. And it supported PCs, uh, head-mounted displays, virtual reality displays. Uh, you'll see that again in a little, little bit. Uh, I think it can actually run on a PC today if you had the executable. Uh, it was it was used at in 1903. No, 2003 uh, was the 100th anniversary of flight, and there was a big <coughs> celebration uh, downtown, and uh, we rigged up a virtual reality 3D demonstration of the Wright brothers simulation that we developed. And uh, there was a lot of VIPs that gave it a test. Uh, this is uh, Apollo 13 flight director Gene Kranz watching pilot Jim Lovell uh, fly the Wright brothers plane. Uh, these are his flights. Didn't do too well. Uh, interestingly, we had some uh, Blue Angels pilots that tested it. And the first time they flew it, they crashed. And one of them says, OK, now I understand it. And he then proceeded to basically keep it in flight until it ran out of fuel. It was pretty amazing to do that in the second time. Uh, John Glenn was there talking to Phil O'Connor, one of our programmers, uh, who now works for a virtual reality company, Magic Leap, in Florida. And uh, we got uh, John Glenn to sign the flyer that advertised uh, the simulation that, that, that he ran. And uh, this was, as I like to say, right stuff on right stuff 
I write stuff. Which has nothing to do with big data. I just like that joke. So. <laughs> uh, there was other applications that are a little more serious for virtual reality. Uh, we created a virtual reality simulation for a treadmill for a collaboration that we did with the, the Cleveland Clinic that was interested in uh, how to train astronauts to overcome the space sickness that they feel from long duration flights. Uh, one of the concerns was you spend 10 months going to Mars in microgravity and you then get out and how do you function uh, if you've been used to microgravity? What do you do to prepare yourself for a gravity environment? Uh, there's all sorts of uh, interesting stories that the astronauts will tell you about uh, um, getting used to life on Earth after you've been in the ISS for months. Uh, you're so used on the ISS to holding something and then just letting go and it'll be right there and floating in front of you and you can pick it up and continue working. Uh, so they keep telling the astronauts, uh, make sure the wife holds the baby when you get back. Don't let the astronauts hold the baby. They'll just assume if they let go, the baby will stay there. Uh, so we created a virtual reality environment that linked to the behavior of the treadmill so that uh, uh, the person on it could basically get the feeling that they were in a gravity environment while they were doing their exercises. Uh, we had some larger, fully immersive environments that you didn't require head-mounted displays and others. Uh, this was an immersive desk that uh, Rich Reinhardt is out there looking at. Uh, this is Laura Monroe, one of our graphics developers, who I see saw, signed on. Hi, Laura. Uh, she's at Los Alamos. Uh, playing with better toys, I think, than, than we had. Uh, we took a lot of these environments because some of them were portable, quasi-portable, uh, to events. This was one in Washington, D.C. that uh, uh, we, we took all of our stuff to. And, and again, the value for being able to explain your research and have some way of getting the attention of non-scientists uh, is quite valuable. Uh, this is Dennis Kucinich, Clevelanders remember him. In around 2000, we as expanded our virtual reality capabilities uh, considerably with the building of the Groove Lab, uh, which stood for Glenn Reconfigurable User Interface and Virtual Reality Exploration Lab, which actually called it Groove Lab first then try to figure out what it stood for. Typical NASA. What I mentioned, the high performance commuting and communication environment or program, uh, they funded a series of collaborative environments at NASA. There was one at our center, Langley and Ames, with the idea of allowing researchers to interact with one another in virtual environments, uh, things that nowadays gamers do all the time. My eight-year-old grandson does collaborative games in, in a virtual environment, much more sophisticated than anything NASA did at the time. Uh, the, the lab was actually built in a room that held the disk drives for a mainframe. And uh, let's see, I think I have, yeah, this is, this is a time lapse of the actual building of the lab. I think half the budget went to ladders. <laughs> Let me kill that. That goes that goes on for a while. But uh, you could see it had these large glass screens, and it was all rear projection and 3D. And nowadays, schools can do this for a fraction of the cost. There's Dot Carney. And this is uh, Rich Reinhardt giving an example of looking at some visualizations in the Groove Lab. And by reconfigurable, <laughs> it wasn't trivial, but uh, you were able to, it was on wheels, you were able to slide it around and move the screens so that 
they either formed a cube environment or in this case a flat environment or like an amphitheater so you can reconfigure the environment for different purposes of visualization so uh let me wrap up with uh, some work that i'd asked uh, the, the, the folks at the gvis lab to say what are you guys doing now and uh when it looks like they're doing the same thing they were doing then uh, but with bigger data sets uh, each of these visualizations, from what I understand, uh, used approximately a third of a terabyte data sets. So again, once you get more capabilities, all you do is you slice up your grid even finer. And, and here looks like almost the same combustor, I don't know if that's a uh, turbine or a combustor, but uh, again, you can see that the nature of looking at the details of the uh, turbulence and other effects are just uh, a lot more sophisticated and they do an awful lot more study, which requires a lot more computing. And it is rocket science. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that uh, we were, I think, very fortunate enough to, to get involved with was uh, up until 9-11, it was a fairly open environment, and we had lots of tour groups come through our lab. Uh, these included everything from uh, kindergartners and, and K-12 students, universities, uh, industry people, local and state governments. Uh, a lot of them came through the lab, and we were anxious to show them technology that uh, uh, was unique to NASA at the time, but would later wind up in uh, Best Buy. Uh, we also participated in events like uh, Ingenuity. We were part of the Ingenuity Festival for the first several years. Uh, we've had students from the Cleveland Institute of Art uh, bring their models into our virtual reality environments to see what they can do. Uh, so we were uh, a nice group of uh, uh, civic participants that uh, got a chance to see what NASA was doing and uh, uh, where their money was spent. Uh, this this is a letter from a fifth grader that came through the lab, uh, and he was impressed with a demo on the Silicon Graphics that had a spider walking across a checkerboard. So when he went back to school, that's what he didn't care about the science. He was interested in that spider walking across the checkerboard. So one of the reasons that the NASA GVIS lab worked was we had a combination of centralized and local resources. If it was too expensive for everybody in the lab to have, we would get it and then make it available to them. So they would learn how to use it so that by the time the costs came down and they would wind up being able to put something in their own environment, uh, they already knew what to do with it. Uh, we also had support from our upper level management and working with great teams. And we had the best users and collaborators. I mean, we really enjoyed working with them all. Uh, so again, thanks to the many researchers, some of which are logged in now who collaborated with us and trusted us to represent their work, uh, hopefully honestly. And uh, a big thanks to the old GVIS team. Uh, some of these people are online now. And uh, there's now a new GVIS team that uh, Herb Schilling has taken over for me. And uh, these are a bunch of people that are now associated with the GVIS team. Uh, so I want to thank them, uh, as well as Herb and Doug for conning me into doing this talk. Uh, John for zooming it, uh, and also thanks to uh, Nora Peterson, who, uh, from what I understand, uh, helped promote this and uh, managed to con a lot of people into logging in. So with that, I will uh, try to figure out how to stop this. Oh, right here. Yeah, and, we, we can uh, just take questions. Uh, see if there's any questions. I'd be glad to take questions. Oh, and, and one person I want to thank real quick, uh, John Murdoch and the Linux Foundation. Thanks so much for the, uh, letting us use the Zoom. Um, we couldn't do, we literally could not do this without you. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you, John. Um, yeah, and on with the questions. Uh, Jay, you just want to read them? Uh, why don't you just read them straight off of the chat? Oh, uh, okay, let's see. Oh. Uh, where do I see the chat? Oh, Q&A? 
or chat? Uh, no, there should be a chat um, section. I, I, I can read them. I don't oh, there it is. Okay, yet. I see. Uh, well, let's see. So let me see if I can tell the questions. Uh, we'll begin shortly. Where do the questions start? Or are we are we looking at the end? Yeah, we're at the end. Uh, so oh, okay. Uh, your question from Paul Castellano: uh, What's the oh. visualization behind you? Oh, <laughs> that that tricky visualization. Um, how's that one? That's. <laughs> The data visualization has gotten to the point where you can do real-time visualization uh, on a PC. And our, our group has taken to various, uh, uh, the Science Center and others, an application where you can put a shape down on a piece of paper that gets photographed uh, by a video camera fed to a computer that does a real-time flow visualization and uh, then displays it in real time. I was going to try to use that to create a video, uh, but instead I uh, uh, created a bitmap of, of me. And there's a program called FlowSquare, which generates uh, various solutions to, I'm not sure what kind of equations, <laughs> but uh, that's what that was about. I have no idea if those are pressures or, anyway, it was something I did this morning. <laughs> Nothing as sophisticated as uh, what my team does. <laughs> and hi, Paul. Uh, where uh, do you see NASA? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that was the next question. Where do you see NASA and uh, virtual reality in the next three years? Uh, there's been a running joke that uh, virtual reality is the up-and-coming technology and has been so for the, and will, has been so for the last 20 years. Uh, <laughs> I, it, it's, it's an interesting thing that I don't quite understand. And uh, I'm very big in 3D photography and uh, looking at stuff in 3D, you have 3D TVs. And that came and went because people poo-poo the idea of wearing glasses to watch something in 3D. But they'll think nothing of putting on headsets and uh, you know, walking around, uh, walking around the house in virtual reality. I, I don't understand it. There's a lot of new technologies for uh, making virtual reality and particularly augmented reality where you superimpose the virtual world on the uh, real world. Uh, interestingly, I don't think it's NASA that's doing any of the cutting edge work in that. They're basically from, from what I gather, uh, being able to test a lot of it, but I don't know if they're developing a lot of it because so much is being developed by industry, by gamers, by uh, companies that are, that are using it for a lot of more demanding applications, surprisingly, than NASA would have. <clears throat> so I don't quite know where NASA is going to go. Probably the best thing is to uh, go onto your uh, gaming websites and see what they're doing, and that's where NASA will be in a few years. We're no longer the leader in that. Interesting. There was another question. Do any private flight companies use the lab? Uh, private flight companies or? I'm just reading the question off there. That's all uh, it's from uh, Kirk at the 703. Oh, uh, I don't know. That, that's something that, that Herb Schilling might, uh, might be able to answer in terms of uh, uh, who's doing some collaboration. I know that they're developing an awful lot of applications for uh, other research uh, labs around the country. Uh, and NASA Glenn has always partnered with uh, companies to use their wind tunnels, to use their uh, drop tower facilities, to use other things that uh, uh, that they may not be able to have access to. Uh, uh, maybe at some point Herb Schilling can jump in on that. I, I've been retired for 12 years and uh, go back there to either uh, uh, serve ice cream to the interns or uh, catch up on what they're doing. Oh, we got a comment from Herb. He says, not really. So oh. I think that answers that. So the answer is not really. <laughs> um, next question uh, from Michael. Did you work closely at all with the hardware companies and how much did they assist you uh, with those, uh, with the computing? Uh, yes. Um, 
both with the hardware companies and the software companies. Uh, the, the, the center worked uh, quite extensively with the hardware companies uh, uh, that are developing the computer technology. For example, that, uh, that LACE cluster that I was referring to uh, that used a bunch of IBM uh, workstations, uh, those were interconnected to a very experimental switch that IBM was developing uh, and we were one of the first places to get access to that switch for interconnecting workstations. Uh, so we did an awful lot of uh, work with them to look at uh, everything from operating system and user management and program management, queuing systems uh, that would later become uh, part of the, the, the way people use clusters today. Uh, but we also worked with the hardware manufacturers, the, uh, the, the companies that built the, uh, uh, the virtual reality equipment for the, Vers the MRSA desk and the Groove Lab. Uh, we were often uh, one of the first groups to uh, get access to those and uh, they came out and developed some stuff quite extensively with, with our facilities in mind or, or learning from some of our applications. Also the software companies that wound up doing uh, some scientific visualization, uh, they wanted to be able to uh, support virtual reality, HMDs, large screen uh, 3D devices, and uh, they didn't have access to them. So uh, uh, there were companies that wound up using our facility uh, and sending us uh, drivers and things to test out their software uh, in virtual reality uh, that they can then use to basically make it available to others. Uh, so yeah, we worked quite a bit with uh, the hardware companies. Uh, and I think, uh, Herb, Herb can probably throw in, I, I think they're still working with the uh, companies like uh, Microsoft and the, the HoloLens, uh, which is a augmented reality device, uh, you know, to, to basically be a uh, beta tester and, you know, help develop a lot of the uh, uh, technologies for that. So, yeah, we do. Well, um, let's see the... Uh... Oh, Mark Celestina. Oh, hi, Mark. It actually, it goes back. Mark Celestina and uh, uh, Rick Mulek and uh, researcher uh, uh, John Adamczyk, uh, they worked with companies like Cray because they had codes that could take advantage of Cray's vector architecture. And so every time Cray came out with a new computer that they wanted to be able to brag how fast it ran, uh, would call these guys up to put their programs on their computers because they knew how to basically uh, milk every mega flop out of the things. So it, it wasn't just our group. The, a lot of the researchers worked with the computer companies that evolved at the time uh, to help test out their, so, you know, when you spend $30 million on a computer, not a lot of people have the ability to do that. And the computer companies want to see what you're doing with it. So they can sell you a $40 million computer. <laughs> no. Is, Mark, Mark says they gave him time. Uh, in many, I know Cray is still uh, somewhat in business. Are you talking about... Uh, that they gave you time. Oh, they gave you time from midnight to 6 a.m. Oh, that was back in those days. Okay. Because Cray, Cray still exists. So, any other questions? I think we're. Uh, I Ooh. think we're uh, we're at the uh, at the Ooh. end here for the questions. Oops. Oh, wait, Helen's question. Let's see. Well, let me scroll back to see what Helen's question was. What was Helen's question? I'm looking to. Um, oh, here. What, is, what NASA is using now is available to us. What do you see being used today that will be in, uh, in the near future? Oh, uh, well, the, the, the HoloLens is a pretty sophisticated little augmented reality device that that lets you see the real world but you see superimposed in it uh, all sorts of other objects. Uh, that kind of technology 
is, from what I understand and, and, and read, being uh, much more sophisticated. Instead of, instead of having heavier glasses, they're now thinner, they're lighter, they use more sophisticated optics. Uh, the company that uh, one of our programmers, Phil O'Connor, went to work for, um, Magic Leap, uh, had a real sophisticated uh, device, uh, so sophisticated they almost went bankrupt developing it, uh, but they're now using it, from what I understand, for corporate uh, uses. But Google, Microsoft, and Apple are all working on much lighter, easier to wear devices that can uh, basically show you uh, virtual objects superimposed on uh, things that you can do with your phone now. I mean, you know, nowadays you can hold your phone up in front of a building and uh, uh, it'll, it'll tell you where all the eateries are inside that building, you know, but uh, I'm sure NASA is not the only one that's looking at that. Hey, there was one from Herb. Uh, what was your favorite moment where a VIP got it as a result of seeing a GVIS present, uh, visualization? Um, <laughs> there, 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 there are two stories, both, in, both involve the same person, John Adamczyk. Um, the first one was we had the Immersa desk at a uh, uh, conference and uh, he was able to drag over the head of GE aircraft engines to look at the simulations that he did uh, in virtual reality, looking at the, the flow around the blades in an engine turbine. And uh, one of the things, not only was the GE researcher impressed, but he was a little disconcerted by the fact that in virtual reality, you could see the shape of the blades in much finer detail than on any of the publications or things that they had let out to the public, even though it was not a proprietary visualization that we were doing. Uh, so he understood that you can see an awful lot more in virtual reality if you had the ability to stick your head in, move things around, and look at things in more detail uh, than you would on a, on a workstation. So uh, he, was, he, was pretty, he was pretty impressed with that visualization. Uh, the other one was we had some researchers from the Cleveland Clinic that had brought in some some type of CAT scan. I don't know, they weren't MRIs, but they were some type of very high resolution scans of uh, the nerves in, from, a, from a rat's brain. And uh, we had a way of uh, doing volume visualizations in the Groove Lab uh, where you can basically move your head and look around and so he was basically inside this rat brain looking at all the nerves and he noticed a twisting of the nerves around certain things that he said he has never seen before. And uh, that was something that he had, he had looked at dozens of times on a computer terminal that he was able to, you know, rotate and move around on his computer screen, but it wasn't quite the same as seeing it uh, in 3D and uh, uh, being in virtual reality. Uh, the other one that was a somewhat interesting one is a, a, Cle a Cleveland Institute of Art student uh, had made a bunch of models of uh, uh, Roman gods and uh, uh, he made a model of Athena uh, that was pretty impressive. Uh, uh, if you can imagine Athena in all of her glory and when he brought it into the Groove Lab and uh, was basically standing next to a full-size image of the woman that he created, uh, he was a little intimidated. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's one thing to, to basically see a little model, you know, on your desktop, but uh, when you see it and you're looking eye to eye into it. Oh, and, and, and one other thing, the, the head of the Cleveland Art Museum uh, came over one time, Catherine Lee, and uh, we had, uh, as a demo, had gotten a hold of a digitized version of Michelangelo's David. Uh, that uh, we had in virtual reality. And uh, you were able to, you know, move in, zoom around, move up. And we got to face level where she was looking right into David's face. And she said, she has seen the actual sculpture of David dozens of times in real life, but always from the floor level looking up. She had never been able to go and actually see the detail of David's face 
in the size and shape looking right at it. And so uh, she was extremely impressed. This was at a time in which the art museum was actually considering creating a virtual reality uh, uh, facility in the art museum, specifically for looking at things like sculptures and other things, hmm. uh, archeological stuff. Uh, it, it wound up not being utilized for that purpose, but I, I think that the, the room where their uh, gallery one is, was originally intended to be a virtual reality environment. Interesting. So, anyway, any more, any more questions? And I, hi I to all my old colleagues. That's uh, that's great. I think this uh, I think this is the uh, the the end. Um, again, thanks. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you, John, for uh, for the support on this with uh, Linux Foundation. And again, thanks for all of the NASA employees, current and former. Um, who have uh, who have supported this uh, meetup and then spread the word around? We had a 101 people on it um, at peak, so I think it was a great success. And again, thank you, uh, thank you, Jay, for for doing this. And Herb, thank you very much for helping me on this one. And everybody, stay safe. Cool. Stay safe, everybody.